Welcome to the regular meeting of the Health and Safety Committee for March 13, 2024. I am Chavez, the chair of the committee. At this time, the clerk to call the rolls to verify the presence of a court. Councilor Bean is present. Rain. Present. Ellison. Here. Paul Masano. Present. Chair Wands. Present. Chair Chavez. Present. Like that we have a quorum. I also want to welcome Council Freshman who is addressed in this committee today. With that, the agenda of the meeting is before us. There are three items on the agenda. Item number one is authorizing a free contract with SMG for law enforcement equipment at the U.S. Stadium. Item number two is authorizing contracts with community based organizations to implement the state health improvement partnership plan. Item number three is accepting additional grant funds from the Minnesota Department of Health. For local public funds. Any discussions on these, or would anyone like to pull any of them? We have the queue up. Let me just. Seeing that, I will move approval of the consent agenda. That carries, the consent agenda is approved. Next item is receiving a filing presentation from Kennebec County. <coughs> on this item is Hennepin County of Moriarty, who I will welcome to the front. Thank you so much for being here today and your commitment to help us. County. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. So, we, this is just of what I intend to talk about. But one thing that's really important, uh, is that I came into office, my priority was, one of my priorities was effectively partnering with law enforcement from all of the county. And to that end, uh, appointed Brad Murza. At any time, and get information and data, and he would enforcement enforcement a month before August, four meetings with law enforcement last year. So we all have the goal to live in a safe community. We want to do what we can to collaborate to make a uh, community safe. So I, I use that as a kind of a here. So I want to talk about your end numbers here. This is data, big believer in data. I think. The important thing about these numbers is that it is critically important for all of us to understand what the actual issues are we have to address. And that's important for us to collaborate and work together to figure out effective solutions. So as we met with law enforcement early on in the administration, we heard from law enforcement and looked at the data of the clearance rate. So these data from the Bureau of Criminal so the this is reported to the BC by law enforcement agencies. And you can see a breakdown of the types of offenses. But you can see the numbers of offenses that were reported by MP. And that goes 21, 22, and 23. So the clearance data is important for a couple of reasons. One is that um, there are offenses reported to law enforcement, and there are offenses that law enforcement sends to our office for potential charges. Clearance data is important also because we know that a big part of deterrence is the belief that you are going to get caught. If you don't believe you're going to get caught, it's less of a deterrence. So those are a couple of reasons why clearance data is important. So if you look at the data, um, it's broken down by all Hennepin County law enforcement agencies and MPD broken So probably the one of the big issues that you've all heard about and that we have heard about are car theft, right? That's one of the only categories of crimes that's gone up in the past year. We all know some of the reasons why. But what's important to look at here is that there were 7,856 car thefts reported to MPD. That did pretty accurate. As we know people report or report 
car theft is of insurance. So of the 7,156 cases that were actually reported to MPD, they cleared 2.3%. So 2.3% us generally for potential charging. So I am a big believer in collaboration. I have been in the system for years. And one of the things that I saw is pointing and blaming. We are all here together to do the best that we can um, to make the community safe. And so bring up this data we know thefts become much more difficult to prove. We know that young people who are driving cars, you can have five six young people from a car, they are wearing masks. It requires intensive investigation at times to be able to identify. Also in there when they go to an egg robbery or some other things. So we know uh, clearly it's tough and we know that investigation in these cases is difficult. And that's not, that's pointing out and can this an issue to uh, the point of what can we all do to work together on this problem? So uh, these are total cases that have actually been received by us. Uh, what we have our own data for this public. And you can look at that any time to see about our decision. County attorney, sorry, just know that the audio is full right now. I've been getting messages. I'm trying to figure out how to, I think this is a really important conversation. The public, the public is watching from home, can't fully hear it, the audio. So if maybe help figure out how to approach this situation, we want to go on a break, it gets figured out. I just, I think it would be fair for the public to not be what you're presenting to today. Yeah, I'm going to move, if you don't mind, if you have a meeting after. Uh, I do not. Thank you. I'm happy to Thank you so much. Step back. Back. I'm going to move to recess this for five minutes until we figure out the uh, your situation so the public can be aware of what's happening. Thank you.
Cool. Thank you. We are reading and the queue if the broadcast is working fine. <laughs> we'll just wait a couple of seconds to make sure that it's functioning and we pass it to our head of the attorney, Mayor Moriarty. So let's just wait a little bit. And uh, like head of Mayor Moriarty just spoke, the county attorney, Mayor Moriarty spoke, and we're going to restart the presentation and make the public hear all of it. So, again, just waiting to get confirmation that the public can hear. I'm getting a text that it's still not working properly. So we'll, we'll keep in recess until the call of the chair, say. Um, which means that we're going to make sure that this is functioning in public. Thank you. We are checking to, to calling the meeting to order, but <laughs> we're checking to see the audio working. We will speak into the mic until we figure out <laughs> if the public those watching can hear us and if people can hear. And I'll speak a little louder since that my voice is really soft. <laughs> Two cities. <laughs> Again, just in case.
We're going to try it again just to see if um, comms can hear us. And I'll just keep speaking to the mic to see if people can hear us. Yeah. <laughs> we will keep on talking to the mic to see if folks can hear us. Okay, I'll keep talking. Oh, we're good to go. We're good to go. It seems like we are good to go. Yep, and people are texting me. We're good to go. Okay. Hennepin County. Okay. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience, Hennepin County <laughs> Attorney Mary Moriarty. We deeply apologize for our technological difficulties. Thank you for waiting and for being here with us today. Of so. course, of course. I understand technology problems, not a problem at all. Thank you, Chair Chavez and members of the committee. So I will start over in a more, I'll probably cut to the chase here. So this is the agenda here that's up here. I'm gonna talk about the 2023 end of year numbers. Uh, I'm gonna talk about our youth auto theft initiative. And one of the things that's really important about this is that the Youth Auto Theft Initiative was not meant, and it doesn't uh, have anything to do with cases that are actually submitted to us that we charge. <clears throat> this was designed to capture those at-risk youth um, and get a path for them in cases where law enforcement could not bring us a case. So I want it to be clear that this is just one of the pieces of our approach on young people. We do charge young people when we're brought cases where we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I have the data on that, although not in this presentation. So I just wanted that to be clear, that this is one component, and it's a really exciting component because the data shows this has been a terrific success. So um, let me go to the next slide here. So I'm gonna talk about year-end numbers, but I wanna say a couple of things about this. When I came in uh, last year ago, January, uh, one of my priorities was to build effective relationships with law enforcement across Hennepin County. And we did that by meeting with all of our police chiefs, sheriff. Um, and one of the things I heard clearly was that there was not enough communication with our office. And so we had a lot of meetings. We met once a month uh, with all of our police chiefs. And we heard their frustrations, and we heard uh, opportunities for us to partner together. This youth auto initiative grew out of that collaboration. So I'm gonna talk about some end of the year numbers, and it's gonna be a lot about clearance data. And the clearance numbers are very low. Um, and there are reasons for that. Uh, and I'll get into that and I'll talk a little bit more about why some of the clearance numbers are low. So this is offense data from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. This is reported to the BCA by law enforcement. This does not go to us. Uh, you can look, um, as you can see here, on the Minnesota Crime Data Explorer, and you can get this information yourself as well. So this, this goes from law enforcement to the BCA. We at the county attorney's office have our own dashboard, and that has to do with cases that we actually get, that we charge, that we divert, that we decline. So you can see some of the numbers here of offenses that are reported uh, by law enforcement over the years. Clearance data. This is important because I think the system is very difficult for people to understand. 
So law enforcement goes out and investigates. If they feel that they have enough evidence to bring us a case, they will submit it. So they submit to us a case. Our lawyers then look at it and decide, do we have enough evidence to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt? So as we've heard in the news, we have a number of young people uh, who are out there involved in car thefts, also aggravated robberies and other crimes. Sometimes what happens is that law enforcement does bring us a case involving a young person, but what they can prove, what they can tell us is that the young person was actually in a car that was stolen. That doesn't mean that we or they can prove that that young person, even though they might have been in a car, that was involved in an aggravated robbery, that that young person was even in the car at the time that that happened. So we are all looking at the elements of each offense. We're looking at what can we charge. So it is an important thing to know that we cannot charge cases unless they're brought to us by law enforcement. So I'm going to repeat that because it's really important. We cannot charge cases unless they're brought to us by law enforcement. So here are some of the clearance rates. So clearance rates in general mean there are reported crimes to law enforcement. And this breaks it up between or of all Hennepin County law enforcement, that's all of our suburban partners, uh, sheriff, et cetera, and then Minneapolis. And I think probably one of the most important pieces of data here has to do with the motor vehicle theft clearance rates. You can see that there were 7,856 auto thefts reported by MPD. That data is pretty accurate because we know people report car theft because of insurance. So of those 7,856 cases, the MPD has brought us for potential charging 2.3 percent of those cases. That's very low. But I want to emphasize, this is I didn't come here to point fingers at MPD to blame anybody else. I am a big believer in being transparent and candid about what the issue is. And this is true to some extent across Hennepin County. So understanding that it's hard to deter people when they, they know they're not going to get caught, how do we work together? Because we're all here to try to make our communities safer. So what could we, as the county attorney's office, do to collaborate with all of our law enforcement, including MPD? And some of the issues, the reasons for that low clearance rate, <clears throat> is that oftentimes you'll have a car, um, five, six young people run away, and they're all wearing masks. And so it, it, you have to do extensive investigation sometimes. That might be forensics, might be DNA, fingerprints. They're wearing masks. You know, how do we identify who the young people were that were actually in the car, where were they, and what did they do? So those are some of the reasons for the low clearance rates. This is uh, case received data from us. We handle all felony level adult cases and all uh, juvenile cases. Um, I'm just going to skip to this. So we receive a case from law enforcement, and then we determine what to do with it. We are looking at cases to see what we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt and what charge we can prove. There are times that cases have been submitted to us where we can certainly prove that a young person was in the car. We can't prove that they stole it. Um, or that they participated in any other type of crime. So we are looking at what we can actually prove. So this is some charging decision by us. Uh, we looked at the last, this is 2023, but we also looked at the last, I think, four years. Charging data is pretty consistent. So there's not a whole lot different in my administration in ter terms of the uh, numbers that are here. And certainly if you want more information about that, I'd be happy to provide it to you. So let's talk about youth auto theft. Um, as I said, the challenge is auto theft is prevalent and it's hard to clear. And we know that a lot of young people are involved. So what can we do to collaborate and work together to try to address the issue where we know there are at-risk young people, but law enforcement is not bringing us the cases to charge. So what do we do? This complicated uh, chart here is just essentially this. Before my administration, if law enforcement said to us, we know that certain young people are at risk, but we cannot prove that they're committing certain crimes, my office would have said, well, too bad. 
That's not our job. Our job is to prosecute cases that you bring us. In my opinion, that's not acceptable because we all need to collaborate and work together to try to figure out how to prevent uh, young people, how to intervene with young people in a way that can get them out of this path. So the red box there is what existed before when you're talking about voluntary services. Um, and we've created that whole red box, which is right there. I'm not going to go through it a lot, but the whole idea here is this. For these young people who are at risk that law enforcement told us they could identify, but they do not have the evidence to bring us a case, we wanted to figure out could we intervene with those young people and try to keep them from coming into the system? What could we do? So we created a whole different path outside the system, and that's in the red box. If we can't charge a young person, the court can't order them to accept services. So this is all about voluntary services. So here's the initiative overview. We started this in June of 2023, and that was after working with law enforcement and getting their feedback for many months. We piloted this. It's now, I would consider it not a pilot because it's been so successful. So what we said to law enforcement is, you know who the at-risk young people are. What if we met with you, and by we, uh, we brought child protection, um, our Be at School, which is our truancy diversion program, all of our knowledge databases, and we met with you, and you just told us the names of youth that you know are out there, they're at risk, but you cannot bring us a case. Because I want to remind you, this isn't about a young person who's robbing you know, somebody that they bring us a case. We charge those cases. This is not that. This is when law enforcement cannot bring us a case because they don't have the evidence. So we have served as a hub, essentially, for connecting these youth and their families with voluntary services from a social worker and other county resources. So we've partnered with Hennepin County Health and Human Services. They're really a core provider for the interventions here. This approach, as it says, is a really meaningful collaboration with law enforcement, children and family services, um, pretty much everybody we could collaborate with to intervene with young people. So we host a bi-weekly meeting uh, for law enforcement partners to discuss potential referrals. We've also told them, pick up the phone and call us anytime. If there's a young person you know is struggling and at risk, just let us know. So what do we do? So law enforcement submits referrals for young people. We review those submissions for eligibility. They are eligible for this if they don't have other cases. You can see, I'm not going to... Uh, read everything on there, but if they have an open case, they're not eligible. If they're in the child protection system already, they're not eligible. So this is a program where it's intervention with young people and their families who don't have, or this far haven't had access to those services. So we screen people, young people, and if they do have, let's say, a child protection case, we will talk to the caseworker and say, hey, this young person has been referred to us. We want you to know that they're engaging in some risky behavior. So we don't do nothing if there's something else going on. But here's what's the beginning of what's really excited here. So we got 179 young people referred to us. 92, that's 52%, were screened in as eligible for services. So that 92%, or 92 of the young people, over half, there were no services out there. Um, there was no intervention at this time. So we screened those 93. 90 were referred to social workers or services from a social worker. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the referring agency. So the top line there is the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. CISA is their intelligence division. And remember, Hennepin County covers all of Hennepin County, including Minneapolis. So some of the Referrals that come from the sheriff could come from Minneapolis. We have Eden Prairie. You can see our top uh, referring uh, entities right there. So what has happened with these 90? And one thing that we learned really early on, when we had our social worker, our be-at-school social worker, reaching out to the families here, 
he was able to reach over 90% of them. And the exciting thing about this, 100% of the parents or the guardians said, we're not surprised that our, our young person is on your radar screen, and thank you, help us. So these weren't parents uh, or guardians or caretakers that you know, were just ignoring the situation and were surprised that we were reaching out. They were asking for help. And so, as you can see here, 55 were referred to a behavioral health social worker. You can see some of the other uh, referrals there. And you can see through uh, December 31st of 2023 what the types of resources were that they were connected with. This is the really exciting thing. Early on when we met with CISA, uh, the Sheriff's Intelligence Unit, they were giving us some statistics and data about when you see a young person starting to engage in risky behavior, like being in stolen cars, how long does it take that young person to behavior to escalate into something more violent? And what they said was that has shrunk. And so it takes a matter of months for a young person's behavior to escalate if there's no intervention. Because we know that youth respond to immediate intervention, right? And we look back at the clearance rates and we know they're not getting immediate intervention, that behavior can escalate. So look at this data. Out of the 82 that were referred, 72 of those young people had no new charged cases between the date of referral Services to services and uh, the end of last year. 72, 88% of these young people did not come into the system formally because the voluntary services that they were provided were successful. That is huge. That is huge. Nine of those young people did have a new charge case, which we charged uh, between the date of referral. But that 88% is something of which we should all be proud because we have collaborated in a way that has intervened in the lives of young people who never would have been identified um, because law enforcement couldn't bring us a case. But hopefully those are 72 young people that are never going to get involved in the juvenile justice system. Some of the other things that we did as an office uh, to change our process. Remember I told you that young people respond um, uh, when intervention is immediate or quick. Before, it took us weeks, sometimes months, to charge a case that was out of custody. We have juggled our resources, and part of our new approach was to, was to um, move up uh, how quickly we charge. So we have young people who are in custody. We've always charged those within uh, the time frame that we are required to. But we made a decision to charge car theft cases within three days, not weeks and not months. We partnered with the bench and asked them to move up that first appearance on an out-of-custody kid so it wasn't months out. So we are trying to speed up the process and have successfully speeded up the process so there is accountability uh, for young people in a much shorter time, which as we know is extremely effective. We also, I think at the beginning of April, are about to have a charging desk. That means that in uh, youth prosecution, we are gonna have a team of people who's going to be making all charging decisions. That will make us much more efficient than we currently are. Okay, so what are the opportunities here? Um, what can we do together? I think it's really important that we continue to build out this ecosystem of prevention and intervention. Having said that, I, as I said to you before, we do charge young people when they're brought to us on, with enough evidence to charge aggravated robbery, for instance. This youth auto initiative is not for those kids. This is for when law enforcement does not have cases to bring to us, but they know those young people are at risk. So we, we need ongoing coordination at all levels, and we need shared advocacy around opportunities and options for young people. I've talked a lot about the lack of uh, community options for young people who are brought into the system. Um, that's an entirely separate conversation, but that's part of the advocacy here. So thank you. And I, I just want to say, I pointed out Mike Radmer, I can't remember if that was in this presentation or the one that happened without sound, but 
Mike is there. He, I appointed him to be the liaison to all of law enforcement in Hennepin County. If you need data, um, sometimes we get questions from law enforcement. Sometimes we get connect, or questions from, um, from councils. What, you know, I've heard that you aren't charging X, or I've heard that you're not doing this. Mike will look up that data. We'll look up that data, we'll talk to you about it, because we believe in transparency and uh, communication. So that's all I have. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today to talk about this really exciting initiative. Thank you for the presentation, Henry County Attorney Mary Moriarty. <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge the presence of Sheriff Witt, Sher Sheriff Witt Chief O'Hara, and Commissioner Barnett, who are in the public. Uh, and I want to thank you, uh, Hen uh, Hennepin County Attorney Moriarty. Some of my colleagues do have questions and maybe even some comments, so I'll first pass it to Councilmember Pomisano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this presentation and for coming to speak with us today. Um, the first question I have is actually back on slide four, and it was just if you could help us and the public better understand the differences between, um, yeah, that one, a crime against a person versus a crime against society. Um, and during the break here, uh, Councilmember Ellison and I looked it up, and we still have some questions. Could you could you help us to understand what when something would get charged? Yep. Is a crime against a person, and, and also how a carjacking when a victim is with their vehicle gets charged? Is that against a person, or is that against, yeah, thanks. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavez, uh, Council Member Palmazano. Yes, a carjacking is a crime against a person. Um, any kind of assault-related crime is an assault against a person. Crimes against society are going to be like a drug case where an officer finds drugs on somebody. It's going to be a prohibited person in possession of a gun. Um, those kinds of offenses where police find uh, contraband or something on a person. The crimes against persons are all those things you probably think are like murder, assault, robbery, sexual assault, all of those types of cases that are committed, you know, harm is done or attempted to be done to an individual in our community. Okay, thank you. And the other clarification I wanted to ask from your presentation is, um, it is terrific the work of people who want to voluntarily get a child in their care into the diversion programs, but it, and it also looks like um, there's kind of this other half that had open cases that therefore aren't eligible. What do you see as being um, helpful, supportive services for that mm -hmm. group of people, or do you see them as already being cared for to the extent possible for that time being? Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Palmazano. I don't think they are necessarily getting the resources that they need. Um, as I said before, if somebody is not under court jurisdiction, they can't be forced to take services. So it's wonderful that you know the, all the people that we called and are participating are voluntarily participating. But there are some people, young people, parents, families that won't do that. We only have so many levers. As I said, you can't force people. One thing that we can do, and, and this, this has become an issue now um, because the court actually just made a ruling recently that said that you cannot hold a young person in the juvenile detention center um, on a non-delinquency case for longer than 24 hours. Um, and we know, and this goes to what I said before, we are in desperate need of placement options for young people in Hennepin County. We don't have enough of them. And what I am talking about, so there are young people who are in child protection or will be released from Red Wing or um, young people that they can't get a case on or something of that nature, and we know they're not safe in the home. They just aren't safe there, either because the home environment is not safe or they're engaging in behavior that endangers themselves or others. We don't have the places to help them because those have to be out-of-home placements in those scenarios. Some of them have to be secure out-of-home placements. There needs to be step-down programs to help them as they transition into their community. And they need to be in community. There are some programs like Red Wing where some youth will go and they'll thrive. They'll get all the treatment, that kind of thing, but they will build relationships with the people that work there. And then they come back here into their community and they're lost. 
because there isn't that transitional step-down help. That is why best practices tell us we need these in-community types of residential programs to really help those youth because we don't have enough of those placements. We're not providing enough care uh, for those young people. And also say we have certified 17-year-olds uh, as an adult. That doesn't get publicized much, and it's not something I'm proud of, because I look at the 17-year-old's history, right? And I see a history of trauma going back to when they were two years old. And I think to myself, if we had successfully intervened with this young person who's experienced this trauma, they probably wouldn't be here. But they're 17 years old, they have this horrific history where there haven't been effective interventions, and we can't keep the public safe. And so we have to certify them as adults and send them to adult prison, which is not a good option. It is not a good public safety option, but that is our only tool at this point with some youth in that situation. Thank you, I appreciate the clarifications and expansion of this conversation. Thank you, Councilmember Pomosano. Uh, Vice Chair Wansley. Uh, thank you, Chair Chavez. I'll actually defer my time, um, considering chairship, uh, to Councilmember Rainville and let him go prior to me. Councilmember Rainville. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, welcome, and thanks for coming over. It's, it's uh, refreshing to hear from uh, the county because you're so important in our justice system. So thank, thank you for you. coming over. Uh, I have a couple questions. One, I noticed that uh, there was great discrepancy uh, in your data of, about referrals from the different police departments. For example, I believe Minneapolis was about 31%, whereas Bloomington was only 4%. And... Uh, uh, Eden Prairie was 16%. There you go. Boy, I got a good memory. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Why do some agencies cooperate and, or, or are they just not paying attention? I don't want to use the word cooperate in a bad way, but it, it seems like some really believe in this program while others maybe do not. I, I would say, I mentioned this before, we built this with our police partners in Hennepin County. So you see Eden Prairie up there, right? That was one of the chiefs that we met with. We tried to meet with all of them, and frankly, some of them don't come, some of them do. Um, and there are some chiefs that are really invested in this kind of program, and they're probably the ones who are referring people. There is, there has, it's taken some time to get people to understand what this is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of MPD, uh, they, let's see, you might remember a Strib article about this youth auto initiative, and we've had, I think, yeah, 37 referrals from MPD, and 36 of those came after that Strib article. Um, I don't know why that happened. I just don't. Um, I think some of it is the information has to filter down so that individual officers who do interact and see some of the same young people need to know about this and it needs to get up um, somehow so that it's communicated to us. And we purposely made this a very informal process. Like pick up the phone, call us, send us an email. We will look at this young person. So we've, we've done what we can to go out um, into these agencies and talk about this. Um, and for some, some people are referring, other people's aren't. And my hope is that, well, I, I should say this. This is a really exciting thing. Some of our suburban police departments have asked us to expand this. Right now, it's only eligible for youth who are um, believed to be involved in auto theft. We've heard a lot from our suburban agencies, please expand this. This is working so well, but we know that there are young people involved in other stuff and we would like these interventions as well. So we're currently having conversations about how to expand it. Okay. Thank you, I have a couple more, Mr. Chair. So you brought up placement options and thank you for, for mm -hmm. recognizing that. Uh, so once, once we recognize the problem, then we solve it. How do we solve the lack of housing for uh, for these juvenile offenders, local uh, housing. Yeah, so Chair Chavez, Council Member Rainville, as, as you probably know because you're on the Juvenile Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, um, Hennepin County did a youth task force on youth options. 
Um, I was a year ago at the legislature asking for money so that we could build out those residential treatment options the same way that Ramsey County was doing it. The county decided to go for a youth task force. What's interesting is you've read in that task force is they say that a similar task force did this study 25 years ago mm -hmm. and the results right now aren't that much different. So I'm gonna tell you my frustration is we know what we need to do. We know what we need to do. There was a report in 2019 that told us what we need to do. We need to have the political will to do it. We have the resources out there. I know, I think they're gonna ask for another task force to study licensing between DOCCR mm -hmm. and, but, but we know what we need to do. And we need to have the will to actually do it on behalf of our youth. Because if we don't do that, we end up with young people engaging in this behavior, and we have guns everywhere. And when you combine guns with the impulsivity of young people, you see some of the gun violence we're seeing today. So we need to invest in these young people. And I think you can see how successful this program is mm -hmm. just for young people who aren't even in the system. So we just have to have the political will to do what people have been telling us that we need to do for 25 years. Thank you very much. I hope the county board is listening to this. So that's where the political will comes from. Let's call it what it is. We need to have our elected officials at the county provide the funding. So I, I'm going to push back on that and say we all need to work together. Mm -hmm. I told you at the beginning of this, I don't believe in uh, blaming, uh, pointing fingers. I believe that we have a problem here in our community, in Minneapolis, in Hennepin County. We all need to work together to get this done. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. And then one last question. Uh, you had, I, I appreciate the observation that deterrence, deterrence is, uh, equates to getting caught. That, that's a big thing. Uh, does accountability uh, figure in, in the deterrence as well? Certainly. And I can tell you this. Um, we, did the, we looked up some data. And for instance, on the cases that we receive from MPD on aggravated robbery, we charge. So there's this myth out there that our office is not charging and holding accountable young people who are involved in violent crime. We do. And I'll tell you this, um, I, I'm sort of uh, charged up about this for, for one reason, or a couple of reasons, that I don't believe in blame, I don't believe in finger pointing, I believe in collaboration and working together. And when I see finger pointing, I get frustrated because we have some of the most dedicated staff in our office. I don't make the charging decisions. Our staff does. The head of our juvenile division, who might be here actually, and another manager spent many hours analyzing the 30 robbery cases that happened in February to try to help MPD chart a path. They did investigation. They care about this community. They care about accountability. They care about young people. And so, yes, accountability is important, but how do we hold people accountable when we're getting cases 2.3% of the time? So we need to be talking candidly about what the issues are without blaming and pointing fingers at other people. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for helping uh, the Minneapolis Police Department with your investigations. They, they surely need the help, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rainville. Uh, Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavez. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mary, for being here. Um, I My first question is related to slide 20, where, uh, of course, you rep reference this significant number of 88% of young people who, you know, are participants in the program do not receive a new charge um, since, you know, the start of this year. Um, I want to know if you had any data that can serve as a point of comparison um, on this, you know, in regards to this being an improvement um, in comparison to like other average rates of new charges. I think in uh, uh, council member Chavez uh, or Chair Chavez, Council <laughs> Member Wansley. I think what we could do is, is compare recidivism rates okay. because these are people who would never come to us in the first place, right? Okay. So it's a little hard to know. I mean, we can say 72 young people didn't come into the system. 
there's probably a way of coming up with data to say approximately how many of them might have. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you in terms of recidivism, which is about what we do when a kid comes in, is, my guess it would be it was much higher than that. But you know, the good news is these are 72 kids we're not seeing in the system. And mm -hmm. the other thing is we all need to focus on helping the whole family right? Mm -hmm. It isn't just about kids. Kids are accountable to relationships, not necessarily rules. And so including the family structure with the young person, that is one of the reasons why this is successful. Awesome. And then actually my next question builds upon um, something that uh, Council Member Rainville raised in terms of um, recognizing law enforcement agency seems to be the primary pathway for, you know, young people mm -hmm. to enter into this program. Um, not only about expanding, you know, the interest in expanding this for other type of offenses, but I'm just thinking of the case of Minneapolis where we have the Office of Community Safety, specifically within that, the Neighborhood Safety Department, where they're also, you know, having a variety of partners that's engaging with at-risk youth, maybe around, you know, auto thefts too, and thinking, like, what would it look like to partner um, with departments like that as part of an expansion effort? Uh Chair Chavez, uh, Council Member Wansley, we, I'd like to see more collaboration there. We have been attempting to do that for over a year, um, and I guess we haven't. I would like to see more collaboration there. You know, for instance, GVI, Group Violence Intervention, was highly successful, I believe, in 2019 in mm -hmm. terms of getting gunshots to go down. Um, it's been a perplexing issue as to why all of those pieces can't get into place where we could all work together. I mean, we've had meetings with uh, uh, U.S. Attorney Luger. There are many of us who want to collaborate and support this work because we know violence intervention is critical. But for whatever reason, it's been hard to get that off the ground. Okay, that's good to know. We actually have a presentation on uh, YGVI next, so that's really helpful. I think content. it's on GVI. Uh, yes. We are actually working on YGVI, um, oh. our, you know, through the county, too. I mean, this, I think you all recognize there's been, <laughs> and I used to laugh about this, it's like I was over in Hennepin County and Minneapolis was across the street, but it might as well have been miles away, right? I mean, we, we have tended to work in silos, and, and that's to the detriment of our community. And so to the extent that we can break down, you know, is it, is it the county, is it the city, is it this department or that department? We need to work together. Um, and we've been really trying to do that and navigate the county systems and the city systems because there are really data-proven successful uh, interventions that have happened in the past um, that just aren't happening right now. And we continue to try to collaborate on those because we believe that they are incredibly important. In fact, we put money towards YGVI, our own money from our own budget, because we believe that that's important. Um, and so I'm hoping for uh, maybe more collaboration and partnership this coming year because spring is here upon us, summer is coming up, and we know summer is a critical time mm -hmm. in violence in our community. No, that's really good, helpful context to, to know. Again, counties moving forward, seems like, again, we can do um, some encouragement on our side for doing that cross-collaboration and coordination. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, especially in preparation for the summer, that we already know what typically happens, the trends mm -hmm. that are pretty consistent in, in instead of being reactive, actually doing the work to be proactive. Um, in regards to that, too, I just want to note when you mentioned the the placements piece of, of the lack of placements, and I know both you, I, and Councilmember Rainville sit on the CJCC, the mm -hmm. Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, which is supposed to be this intergovernmental um, coordinating table, and this has come up most, even in our first meeting around, like, this is a gap of service. And I will just uh, remind my colleagues, one thing that we did bring forward uh, just last cycle is a legislative amendment encouraging our um, lobbyists to actually, you know, yes, around the licensing barrier piece, if that is actually a credible, you know, barrier that's preventing placements, then let's 
like you said, take the action, exhibit the political will to like el eliminate those barriers. Um, but also, I just want to note, you know, for this committee, we're also very interested of how we can continue partnership with the county on being responsive to the summer and figuring out what can we do, especially on the city side, um, for supporting community providers who can either do housing or wraparound services, which it seems like is very much in alignment with you know the diversion program here around auto thefts so i just want to echo like there is definitely definite alignment on that and council has taken some action recently around that um yeah to that mm -hmm. uh, uh chair chavez and council member wansley you, you talked about the meeting that we had last time and i was very pointed at that meeting I believe in task forces, but I also believe in taking action. And it was a year ago at this time. I just come into office, and I was saying, what are we going to do? Summer is coming up here. Um, and I would say, because we were working with all of law enforcement, all of law enforcement in Hennepin County was frustrated about the lack of options for young people. We were all on that same page in really trying to get a sense of urgency on the part of partners who could make those placements and those options happen. And so we had a presentation uh, at the last meeting about this task force, and I asked the chair of the task force, what is different about this? Where are we? It seems like we're in the same place we were last year. What are we doing going into spring and summer? And the answer we got was, another task force and so I'm just gonna say I am very frustrated and more than frustrated this is about lives this is about young people's lives it's about lives in our community when young people are engaging in violence and to sit another summer without taking action is is just reprehensible to me and so we have to start acknowledging the urgency here of intervening on gun violence um, and placements for young people. And we somehow need to all get together and collaborate on pushing those levers to make that actually happen. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for offering that component. Oh, oh excuse me, public. Uh, <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you for that because, again, yeah, that was a very... I think you and I aligned there too of it's, it's, it's time to take action and oftentimes mm -hmm. we see um, the need to take action be met with efforts to delay, stall, task force, everything but the action point. Um, one thing I also want to flag for my colleagues in regards to not only how we can expand diversionary programs like this in collaboration with you all, either strengthening through our collaboration via MPD, but also it sounds like Neighborhood Safety Department too, um, but also thinking through the staffing challenges related to the clearance rates that you mm -hmm. pointed. Um, I know we often hear from law enforcement here around like the staff staffing challenges that they're um, experiencing and how this may be related to us only having that 2.3%. Um, I wanna flag for my colleagues, uh, this committee is going to have a presentation from um, OCS uh, staff around our staffing recommendations. Um, some of you might remember we had a study done back in 2022 um, that had a series of recommendations of how we can um, readdress or revisit and evaluate our staffing resources so that we can do um, or have better outcomes for things like investigations that can then support improvement in clearance rates. Um, we're going to have that uh, legislative directive and presentation from staff come back in June um, and really seeing, okay, is this another pathway for supporting um, those clearance rates so you can get more cases? Um, so, and, yeah. Well, can I just comment on that, mm -hmm. um, Chair Chavez and Council Member Wansley? Um, investigation is a part of it. They're very short of investigators. And at the same time, I know that people worked on a grant and got a grant for MPD to be able to hire retired FBI investigators to help with their investigators, and they turned it down. There are other agencies. Um, when we, so Chief O'Hara applied to PSP, which is a federal program that brought us all together to try to figure out some of these issues, and we were assembled in a room with the FBI, the BCA, ATF, everybody. There were people in that room that want to help, that want to help, but MPD has to ask for that help. And so some frustration I have is, hey, there are resources out there. People want to help you. We want to help you. Could you let people help you? 
and so yes, investigation is an issue. They are very short of investigators, but that is not the only issue. And there are options out there, and I hope the council will will look into those as well. And one that's news to me. Um, and hopefully this legislative directive that we get back in June can be reflective of those additional options. I know that report also talked about so civilianization as being yes. a pathway where, you know, we can civilianize existing positions um, to get investigators. We don't mm -hmm. have to go and try to navigate the 7030 provisions um, to be able to meet this need, but also knowing that in our police contracts, the 7030, if that's also a barrier, we should be evaluating that. And I think our staff is aware of that. But as you highlighted, there's a multitude of options that we should be exploring um, to bump up and beef up our investigative divisions, because mm -hmm. I often hear that on the, the council side or from my constituents of like, I reported a, a, a offense and I've heard nothing since. And it's very clear that is a, a major need amongst our residents and we need to be intentional how staffing conversations are actually directed to where it's most needed. Um, and I just wanted to flag that piece and then, yeah, just reiterate, thank you for being here, coming to present. Um, I know we just adopted a work plan for this committee uh, last cycle and one of our big focuses is doing this intergovernment collaboration because we cannot do it, as you mentioned, in silos and separation from one another. Um, and I have no problem with asking for help. If, we, if there's help out there, which we know there are resources available for us to do this work and figuring out how we can break down the barriers or whatever political issues so that we can actually apply for those resources, work together, and actually deliver for the people who matter most, which is our residents, and then also for the babies. Because we know they are the ones that are mo at, most at risk, and a prison cell is not the ideal option or the only option that should be given to them. So thank you so much for being here. I look forward to doing more collaborations via this committee through CJCC, a number of ways so we can actually have some tangible uh, results to deliver to the people of Minneapolis and across the county. Thank you, Vice Chair Wellensley. I'll pass it to Councilmember Pomosano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few different and they're kind of separate thoughts going on that are all germane to this conversation. The first is, is pretty specific. It was back on your slide 20 um, about the incidence of there being very little recidivism um, mm. amongst uh, people that were referred into this program. And I'm curious, I wonder when those initial referrals were made because the data that we have available right now is only through the end of 2023. So it's not particularly helpful to know if, it's not as helpful to know if there has been no recidivism in 30 days. Um, and I'm sure it's a smattering of a number of different people when they got referred into this program. But um, I guess my point is, will you continue this research? Will you continue to track uh, the people that have been referred into this program from the start so that we can take a look at that together. Chair Chavez, uh, Council Member Pomisano, we have it. Um, I took some of it out because I, I could put a lot in. Um, if you want that information about when people got referred and how long they've been there. And actually these nine young people who had new charges, we know what those new charges were as well. So we will continue to track that because you're right, it is important um, and happy to share that with you. Yeah, I think just for the aspect that we're going to continue to track it is, mm -hmm. is what's gonna be um, particularly helpful. In terms of out of home placement, um, at least the Ramsey County out of home placement development, my understanding is it's not being implemented or it's not able to be impl successfully implemented yet. Um, I wonder, just more out loud for my colleagues, it might be useful to learn maybe through Hennepin County Commissioner Jeff Lundy. Um, he seemed to mention recently that the task force had, he thought, useful information out, and it would be good to know what um, Hennepin County is going and asking the state legislature for in terms of that. And I don't, I, I don't see you as being the target of that question, but I think it's a good question that we kind of follow through and and get I, the answer to. I can't answer part of that question because I talked to John Choi yesterday, uh, Ramsey County attorney, and he said the RFPs either have gone out or are about to go out, which is one of the things that is the reality. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't, I mean, yes, I was okay with the task force, but we needed to put into action plans because 
you have to do a lot of groundwork. They're just sending out the FRP or RFPs. So those things won't actually be built for quite some time. So that's mm-hmm. where that is. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to offer a response to that as, again, a member on the CJCC where mm-hmm. uh, Commissioner Lundy uh, chairs, but this is also public information. The report that the task force commission is available online. Um, it does basically recommend that we need to address licensing as a primary barrier between the Department of Human Services and the Department of Corrections. But it also says we need to do more study of that. So it did not say right now, from my understanding, there is no legislation, there's no bill tied to the recommendations um, from that task force that can be deliberated right now during our legislative session. And I think that's the part that we've highlighted of well, if there's money on the table, can someone bring some legislation that either supports Ramsey County or uh, Hennepin County in diversifying our like housing placements or placement options? And that's the issue right now that we're still trying to dig deep into. But I just want to let you know, right now there's only a task force report that's on the table. And it sounds like the continuation of studying the findings that was in that task force report. And, and I will add to that that Um, Commissioner Lundy did talk about the licensing being a big issue and that the recommendation in the that task force report was to have another task force to study licensing and I said you know we've known about that issue for a long time we know about the licensing issues that's not a mystery so I am not aware of any legislation um, that actually gives or moves this issue forward other than a recommendation for an additional task force Mm -hmm. thank you my last point and comment was um, that I know our chief has asked for further help. Um, I know they've, I believe he's asked for help through the PSP group. Um, I don't know the details of that or I'm asking you to opine on that. But in terms of connection points, something that I found particularly helpful the last couple of years was the connection and understanding and communication that happened through the Minnesota Heals 2.0 program. Um, And I'm just curious, do you find something like that useful or not? Uh, Do you plan to continue that effort, the Minnesota Heals 2.0? No. Um, And the reason why is we can get a whole lot more done um, with our individual meetings with law enforcement. And I mean, we met, I had a convened a meeting with mayors last week, and I've done that before. So the task force, I think, meets maybe three times a year and they get presentations on various issues, but it's not a place where we can actually be nimble and get feedback, like have conversations with law enforcement about what's, what are the issues, what, how can we address this? So I think we are much more successful um, than our office has ever been in um, outreach to law enforcement. We offer training uh, to law enforcement. Some of that really isn't, um, they're not taking us up on that. Um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, to me, it's about communication, right? We just need to communicate with each other. We, don't, we are not always going to agree, but we need to communicate with each other. And that has been a problem right now. I would like to see that communication uh, between MPD and our office improve. Um, but the avenues are there. The avenues are there. We don't need additional meetings, heels, whatever. We are here. We're in it for the long haul. We want to help. And we've made that clear over and over and over. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano. I'll pass it to Vice Chair Wansley, and then I'll put myself on cue. And then we do have staff that are gonna be presenting on two other presentations. So if people are gonna get on cue, I just ask you to be brief. Thank you. Um, Just a follow-up question around GBI, knowing that we do have a presentation after this, and it'll be good to get some clarity on this. So I know you it, you mentioned that the Hennepin County office or your office is going to be proceeding with um, advancement of GVI you said, initiatives. I just wanted clarity on that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavez and uh, Council Member Wansley. So GVI, Group Violence Intervention, was highly successful in 2019. And the data showed that. Mm-hmm. But it is a evidence-based model that has to be followed with fidelity so that you, we aren't uh, stereotyping the, the people that are targeted in that program or referred. 
And so there are certain steps that have to be taken with fidelity to follow that model. And is, you probably know Sasha Cotton, who's a national expert on this. Um, we look to her for all things OVP and violence prevention. And w we just haven't seen fidelity to that model. We have met a number of times, U.S. Attorney Luger and I and MPD and others saying, hey, how do we get this back on track? How do we get this back on track? Um, and it isn't happening. Um, I from our perspective. It isn't happening with fidelity to the model that has data and statistics. There are some people who say they do violence intervention that really may be violence intervention, but it's not evidence-based fidelity to the model. And that's what we are trying to urge uh, us to go back to because it was very successful. Um, why GVI youth? Uh, uh, group violence intervention. That is a little different in that it's young people on probation. Um, and we're trying to get that up and running with the probation department. Um, there have to be uh, violence interruption groups that have fidelity to that model. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm being very intentional about saying fidelity to the model. Because there are all kinds of different groups, people say they're violence interruption. But the tested one, the one that worked here, was the one that follows uh, John Jay, the national initiative, what Sasha put in place here. And so that's what I would urge you uh, to, to really prioritize in the city. And that is what we would like to collaborate with moving forward. Okay, that's good clarification in terms of right now, it sounds like the city, the city, when we're talking about the who, the city right now, and our fidelity uh, to the model in comparison to 2019 is a, a bit unclear. Yes. Okay, that's good to know. That's all I had to ask. Thank you, Vice Chair Wansley. And then I have three questions. Uh, the first one is trying to figure out how the city can be helpful in this program. Do you know some strategies, opportunities, or ideas that this committee, this body, the city can help increase some of these referrals? Like what can we do to help? The yeah. program is effective. It's yes. The data is showing it. And I think it's in our best interest as a city to help refer more people into this program. Mm -hmm. Just trying to figure out how this body can help with that. Yeah, I, I think this program and others that we are trying to do, and thank you for that question because I think it's really about collaboration, and I think to the extent that you can encourage MPD to collaborate and communicate with us, we are all going to be better off. Thank you. And is there any programs maybe, so I want to look at the data. I think it shows that there's around 11% of people that recommitted an auto theft uh, crime that were in the program. That's a very small number, whereas 88% of people did not, mm -hmm. um, based on the data that we have now. Of those 11%, percent of folks is your office exploring like another program that could potentially help with the repeat offenders and then again is there something the city can do to help with that effort yeah unfortunately on that um, they got a new charge so our office charged them and so those young people are now going through the process and of course our lawyers are looking at how do we hold these young people accountable what can we do what are their issues now I, I know there's a lot of confusion. So I, this is not a diversion program. This is a voluntary intervention, um, and I won't get into the differences of diversion, but MPD does have a diversion, or used to have a diversion program, where they would encounter young people and they could refer those young people. They don't come to us. It's MPD diversion, um, and they just refer young people to a restorative practice program that's up and running. And um, we went to talk to Chief O'Hara about this program. We have a sheet which I could give to you that it's from 2019, I think, and it had it was studied by the University of Minnesota. And MPD's diversion program was highly successful. And so we went over to Chief O'Hara and said, "Hey, would you be willing to get this up and running again?" And he was very enthusiastic about it. And we said, "The infrastructure is there. Your people just need to refer young people to that." And so we waited a while, and there were very little referrals. So we went back, and we said, hey, we're not seeing referrals to this program. Um, and then we left, being somewhat hopeful that there would be, and there still aren't. Um, and so what I would say about that is when we're looking at different options, 
we have, and MPD had an option that was studied, I believe, by the University of Minnesota that was highly successful. And they just need to do it. So there, that is a true diversion program. This is a pathway for voluntary services. There are a lot of different pathways there. Um, and we just need to work together and collaborate on those and be really creative about uh, brainstorming new ways of helping. Um, you know, uh, uh, Council Member Palmazano, I, you and I have talked about this. Right? I'm a big believer in data. I'm a big believer in transparency. I have no desire to continue a program that doesn't work. So, of course, we're going to continue to get the data. And when we know programs do work or have worked in the past, why aren't we doing them? And I'm always open to your ideas, too. If you have ideas about what we as the county attorney's office can do to help and collaborate with you, or MPD, we're here. We're here. Thank you. And then my last question is more figuring out how other cities operate with this program. Mm -hmm. Are there any differences between the policies or the way other police departments handle youth auto theft that make it easier for them to gather evidence for charging or refer youth to this program? Um, I don't know other police departments' um, policies mm -hmm. necessarily, but just trying to figure out if there's something we can do besides, you know, right. uh, referring people to this program. And Yep. Yeah. So I would say some of it is about volume. I mean, MPD has more volume than anybody else does. Probably some of it has to do with whether they're doing forensics, for instance, on stolen cars. Are you doing fingerprints? Are you doing DNA? Um, and there are other suburban departments that probably have more time and resources because they have fewer car thefts. So part of it is a volume case. And I don't, I don't know if they have a policy on what they need to do on each stolen car. Um, also, some other suburban agencies do have diversion for young people. It's, it's law enforcement diversion. So they have their programs up and running, and they're highly successful. And it really is depending on the, on the individual suburb. So we have great communication with many of our suburban chiefs. Um, they're very, all very different. Um, but I would say in terms of MPD, it's probably something to ask them. You know, what, do you, what would be helpful to you in trying to clear more cases, um, which is the same thing that we have asked as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Seeing no further discussion, I will direct the clerk to receive and file that report. Uh, Henry County Attorney Mary Moriarty, thank you so much for joining with us and for <laughs> staying beyond the time limit that you were supposed to in terms of the hiccup that we had this afternoon, but really appreciate your time here, and we look forward to engaging with your office. Yeah, thank you, and I just want to say I'm here. I'm across the street. Um, I'm invested in this. We are invested in this, so let's work on this together, and thank you so much. Thank you. Since we had audio issues earlier in the broadcast, I want to note for the record that the consent agenda items one through three on the agenda were approved at the beginning of the meeting, and those items have been forwarded to next week's council meeting. The next item is receiving and filing a presentation on the pathway to a new beginning program. Here to present on this item is Priscilla Brown, the director of the program at Urban Ventures, and Maurice O'Bannon, the assistant director of Urban Ventures Pathway to New Beginnings Program. If I mispronounce your names, I apologize. Please <laughs> say your name when you come up here as you do the presentation. I want to also mention to my colleagues, part of today's presentations are about diversion programs that we have in the city enterprise as well. But we'll welcome our guests uh, up here. You all present yourselves, uh, especially since there's three of you actually, and I just had two names. Thank you. Yeah. And I think we have a new presentation, correct? Yes. And then do you have a? They, we submitted it ahead of time, so it okay. should be loaded. Um, would you be able to help? It, Thank you. So you did it. We gave it to Dylan. We will put it up here. Okay. Or try our best to. So you're going to start. Start. We're just waiting to get the PowerPoint. But you are going to start. Sure. Yep. So, so let me. Let me.
you want me to start with this slide yep. right here? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I will do that. And let me move down a little bit. And for the public, we're putting the presentation up. Our clerks are doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For way of introduction, since I wasn't announced, I am Assistant Minneapolis City Attorney Heidi Johnston. I am in charge of supervising the Pathway Program at the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. I will have um, Priscilla introduce herself. And my name is Priscilla Brown. I am the director for the Pathway uh, Program to New Beginnings. And I will have my assistant director uh, introduce himself. Good afternoon. My name is Maurice O'Bannon, and I'm the assistant director for the Pathway to New Beginning Program at Urban Edge. Yeah. I'll, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And then, as you all speak, just make sure to speak on the mic um, okay. so we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I will actually take this mic button. Okay. And then get started. So thank you, Chair Chavez, for this introduction. And I'm going to get us started here Oops. with this. Why is it? OK, I'm having trouble advancing. But it's, OK, what am I clicking wrong? I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> so. As we get the slideshow figured out, I just want to do the quick introduction of how did we get here and how did we get to Pathways. It's actually one of the better stories of being a prosecutor with the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. Okay. For years and years and years, we prosecuted gun cases in the city of Minneapolis with a pretty firm offer. It was 365 days with 335 days in jail, which meant that the average offender was going to spend 30 days in jail. It was one of the harshest standard sentences we had because gun violence is something that we all had to take so seriously. And one of our colleagues pointed out that if you followed those cases beyond the city attorney's office, we found that most of those offenders were turning up with felony level offenses. So the thought process was what can we do to intervene and what can we do to not have young adults committing felonies? We realized that most of our defendants were African-American males in the age range of 18 to 30. It was their first adult crime. They were getting a 30-day sentence. And then what we found that was even more shocking is 70% of those convicted went on to commit a new crime. When we saw those numbers, we said we're doing something wrong. We opened up a RFP for a proposal, and this is how we got here. So at this time, I'd like to turn over the floor to Priscilla, the head of Urban Ventures, and let her talk about what our gun diversion program looks like in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Priscilla. So as um, Heidi um, um, uh, has uh, opened, a, uh, opened up for me to talk about, the program started back in May of 2017. And one of the things that uh, John Turnesty, who has um, passed away um, uh, last uh, November uh, of last year, talked with uh, Mary Hang and, and now Susan um, Siegel, who is now a judge. One of the things that they were looking at was what was really being overlooked in, in the men that uh, they were seeing this disparity um, that continue to keep black men uh, going to the direction of uh, being charged uh, with, with this crime. And he mentioned one word, and that word was trauma. And that was news to Mary and, and Susan. So as Heidi said, uh, they put out the RFP. The RFP short, uh, uh, story short was uh, granted to Urban Ventures. Uh, John walked into my office one day and put the contract in front of me and said, write the program. And I thought, OK, what program? And so, as it have as uh, it has um, as the story ends up, 
I looked at what is it that I want these uh, young people, although the program uh, is, is generally offered to or, or attended by uh, males, it is open to females as well. Um, my first question was, what is it that I want uh, these people coming through the program to walk away with? I come to this uh, project with a degree in marriage and family therapy. And working in my community at that point in time for about 30 uh, some, some odd years, working with families, individuals with uh, uh, ment mental health issues and problems, one of the things I agreed with John Turnipseed is that I saw time and time again is unaddressed trauma, unaddressed um, uh, the ability to the ability to deal with um, Ill, um, unregulated emotional disturbances and anger management. I decided that those were the three things that needed to be addressed. So from that point is where I begin to develop the program. So at that point. We, I developed a program around ad addressing those three issues, and the program um, uh, morphed out to be um, nine months in, in duration. It is divided into two phases, and the first phase of the program is 12 weeks. That is the most intensive part of the program. It is as close to uh, going through individual therapy as one can get. One of the things that I knew uh, and, and still is the same uh, thinking is that most of my community uh, will not uh, uh, go through therapy. So I wanted to be able to have that uh, first part in the first phase of the program um, uh, as, as closely as I could possibly get to be that place where we would be able to reach as deep as we could to bring about a place of guiding them into a place to be able to first identify trauma, help them to understand the trauma and to be able to um, understand how trauma alters the brain, how it, uh, um, how it alter the, alters the brain and how trauma actually um, functions and, and changes their perspective in making decisions in their lives. So that's, that's the uh, point that, that we wanted to get to in, in the uh, first phase, looking at that, looking at giving uh, uh, them the opportunity to make changes in their lives, to challenge that uh, place of healing. In fact, phase one is titled healing from the pain, reaching down and being able to heal from, from the pain of trauma, uh, being able to gain the skills that they need to change the faulty thinking that comes out of that, being able to learn how to regulate emotions um, and to deal with the anger that comes out of that. After uh, completing the first 12 weeks of the program, they move into phase two, which is a uh, place where they then begin to, uh, um, to deal with goal settings uh, and looking at doing things like um, setting goals to look for employment, looking at career uh, changes and, and setting um, uh, goals around those type of things. Um, one of the things that we know and that we have learned that works uh, for our program is that 
we build a sense of relationship with the people that comes through our program. That makes the difference in how we relate, how we treat uh, those that are coming through our program. It has definitely made a, relate, uh, a difference in how people begin to uh, not only understand who they are, but make the changes in, in their lives as they begin to grow, as they begin to change, as they begin to um, develop a sense of who, who they are uh, in, in their uh, life as they uh, begin to understand purpose and, and how they move uh, from the place where they begin when they first come through, um, through the program. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Maurice jump in because there is a piece of uh, the program that he, um, he does that gives a little bit more of the in-depth piece of communal he healing that really uh, expands on uh, the piece of, of healing that is so important to how it, how it adds to the healing of, of the person. So just to so to just elaborate a little further on what we do in phase two of the program, because that's the enrichment part. So like Ms. Priscilla stated, we do the first, I, I designed the curriculum for the enrichment program. My background, I have a bachelor's degree in human services with a minor in family studies. We, uh, first week, first month is they create an action plan and they set three different goals that we hold them accountable to trying to accomplish by the time they're done with their six months in phase two. The second month, we have a professional come in who does resume writing, cover letters, and helps them get all that stuff updated. Then we also have the director of our college and career program come in to provide them with different opportunities that might be available to them or looking at the trades or starting their own businesses. We have a financial literacy and awareness piece where someone comes in and talks to them about the basic financial skills like opening an account, creating a budget, understanding how much you're spending versus what you're making. And then the last piece is they create their own personal code of ethics and goals that they have to explain to us prior to leaving. This is who I am now and this is how I'm gonna live. So to get into the communal healing part, my mentor Resma Menicum has a quote and it says, what is communal healing? Healing involves capacity and choices. Not everyone can heal according to the same timeline or in some cases, any prescribed timeline. Well, everyone can heal. For some people, healing may not be safe at this moment, and they must wait for their circumstances to change. And I feel like we're that circumstance that changed for many of these individuals. It's a safe space for them. They trust us. They know that we grew up in similar communities. And the reason we call it communal healing is because what we're really addressing is communal trauma. Mm -hmm. And we understand, me being a black man who born and raised in North Minneapolis, I know why some of these men and women that end up in our program ended up there, right? Like, I, we don't approach our clients as they're defective individuals. They're products of an environment. And sometimes, like, if you've never lived in the shoes of a homeless person, you might not know why they have a gun. If you don't have to walk past crack houses and gang houses and trap houses, you might carry a gun in your car too if you had to worry about something happening to your kids. Because most of the people that come in our program, they're not thugs, gang members, or criminals. They're just people that got caught with a gun. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they're sending people to us that got caught with BB guns that aren't even loaded. So, I mean, to, to look at them in a certain light is what we don't do. And by about the third week of the program, it's family. We provide them a meal. We, for some of them, it's the only cooked meal they might get all week. We, we provide holiday parties, summer picnics where they can bring their family out. And most importantly, during that case management phase, like we, we build relationships, we get to know them. We've had a brother come in our program who did have no self-efficacy, and now that he's got three months left, he started his own LLC, he's put all the skills he learned in Job Corp down in Mississippi to work, and, and he's a businessman now. 
we, we have one participant who's going back to school to potentially hopefully get hired by us in the next six months to a year. So I think for me, the, every, like a lot of people throw the word trauma-informed out, right? Well, being trauma-informed just means you can read or watch a YouTube video. We're trauma-responsive. And that's why our program works and yields the results it does. So with that being said, I'll pass it to Heidi so she can go over some of our statistics. Since we're here talking about city initiatives, I did think it would be worthwhile exploring what this program has really meant. So when we talk about what these cases looked like before, it meant they were convicted of a gross misdemeanor. 75% of them were going on to felony convictions and that would impede the rest of their life. Now, when we get a gun case, we screen it. We look to see what their criminal history is. Have they had any other gun cases? Have they had any other crimes of violence? I actually have a slide that will show you specifically the factors we're looking for. Um, we also really gave Urban Ventures and Ms. Priscilla the ability to tell us what are the cases that matter to you? They said, hey, domestic violence is one we really want to be on the screen for because people with prior domestic violence are also going to fall into this trap and we don't know that our program can reach them. We uh, look for whether or not they've had any other nonviolent felony offenses within the last five years. And once we screen a case, if they don't have any of these red flags, we go ahead and approve it. And by approving it at the city attorney's office, it means instead of a conviction, they get a stay of adjudication, which a stay of adjudication means they've entered a plea, but the judge holds it under advisement for two years. That's the two years that gives them all of the time through the Urban Ventures program. The other piece of this program that's really unique is we have also said, after your two years of probation, if you're successful and you complete, the plea is never accepted. So there is no conviction. One year after that, as long as you've had no new offenses, we will actually do a prosecutor-initiated expungement. So we will expunge it from your record. The thing that's really interesting about gun laws in the state of Minnesota is gun violence is serious, and we take these crimes very seriously. So they're enhanceable both on priors and on your experience. So if we didn't expunge this, it is potential that a conviction for a pistol without a permit, the gross misdemeanor offense, if you have a prior conviction, your second one could be a felony. So we're trying to avoid having these individuals that go through pathways come out with a felony offense. So when you look at our numbers, uh, the other thing I want to mention to the council that I do think is important to remember is the city attorney's office fully funds this program. This is nine months of intensive programming through Urban Ventures, and we are not asking the participants to pay. The city attorney's office came to the council and said, we want to offer this diversion program and we are going to pay. So from the minute we send them over to Urban Ventures, Urban Ventures bills the city attorney's office, the participants are able to go through the program for free. I'm going to jump to the statistics we just did for 2024. Since this launch of this program, we have screened over 570 total cases for eligibility. 253 of them were not eligible. So despite our best efforts, we still have cases that aren't eligible. Of the 317 that were eligible for the program, 97 rejected the program. Honestly, we need to communicate with people entering this program. This is every Thursday. When Maurice and Miss Priscilla talk about building family, they are literally meeting with them every Thursday. It is a serious commitment. So we've had 97 people say, not for me, I don't wanna do this. 190 accepted the program and of that 190, 109 graduated. 37 people were terminated. Right now we have 44 in progress and we have 30 unresolved cases. So let's look at the people that graduated, why we're here, and why we think our program is a success. 60 of the graduates have had absolutely no recidivism. That is 64% of people that graduated the program have had no new offenses. Remember what I said before, prior to Pathways, 75% of people with a pistol without a permit conviction would have recidivism. Unfortunately, we have had one of our participants die due to gun violence. Um, we had 33 graduates with recidivism, but when you specifically look at what their recidivism is, 
We broke it down so you can see that specifically. 12 were convicted of a new gross misdemeanor or misdemeanor offense. Six of them have pending misdemeanor or felony offenses. It's important to point out pending offenses because sometimes those cases may get dismissed, may get diverted, they may not ending up be, they may not end up as recidivism. 11 have been convicted of a new felony offense. Six have a pending felony offense. So essentially, if you only count new convictions, Recidivism has been reduced to 24% if you look at actual felony convictions. So that's why we're here today. This is a program the city attorney's office launched and it really has shown us to be incredibly successful in terms of what our statistics are. The other thing I wanna give a real shout out to is when Chair Chavez asked if we were willing to present. I could have come to you as the city attorney and given you this PowerPoint, but I really wanted you to meet Ms. Priscilla with Urban Ventures because she does speak on behalf of the city in building this program with Maurice. So Chair Chavez, thank you for your time. Ms. Priscilla, is there anything you would like to add? I, I just wanna add that uh, together with, uh, with Maurice, as Maurice said and hit on it that the difference in uh, what we do. It is intense, um, as uh, Heidi pointed to, um, to it uh, in, in giving the statistics. Um, we look at um, every person that comes through this program as a person that is not defective, but a person that is, is worth um, our time and a second chance and a person that can change. We look at um, each person that comes to, through the door as someone that needs to and, and can heal from their trauma. Every, every person in this room, every last one of us, uh, are impacted by trauma each and every day. We all, though, um, react to trauma in, in different ways. So we know that because the people that we have the blessing, and I do mean blessing, to touch and to help to understand how trauma has impacted their lives and to see the, the bubs go on as they are able to get a handle on and begin to change their lives. It is such a great um, thing to, to have happen because it is a, a huge commitment to see people come in and, and, and be with us all day because programming is every day from 10 o'clock in the morning to 3.30 for, for 12 weeks. And that's a huge commitment. There have been some that have had to lose their jobs, which we certainly don't want to happen. But if they are really committing to the program and employers, and there are some that will not give them the time off work, and they make the decision that this is what I want to do, to take the opportunity to make the difference in my life, and they do it, and they finish. And there are the stories that we have seen, the lessons that we have learned, and people have really made the changes and, and have gone on to make a difference in their life and the lives of their families because they have children, that they are becoming healthy role models that's changing families and, and families change communities. And I listen to Mary, Mary Ordy about what we need to do to work together. Urban Ventures has just gotten a grant to now be able to offer these services now to people before they commit the crime. So hopefully we can start touching people 
to make the changes in their lives so that they can think differently before they commit the crime so that we can work together to make the change in our community. And I give God the glory because he and he alone, he alone is the one that has touched this program, touched the hearts of those people that care to make this thing work, and he will continue to do the same. That's all thank, I have to say. Yeah. Thank you for that presentation, Heidi. We appreciate the city attorney's office's work and for funding this program, and for Priscilla and Maurice for helping run it, and for your passion to change the lives of our community members here in Minneapolis. Uh, it's clear that this program is saving people's lives, and it's something that we as a city can have to continue supporting. We do have a BET meeting at 4 p.m. We should try to get out of here by 3.45 p.m. The hiccup uh, this afternoon <laughs> with the broadcast set us up a little bit behind, so I'll just ask our colleagues to try to keep it brief because we have another presentation. But I'll first pass it to Vice Chair Wansley and then Council Member Rainville. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you so much for being here. It's really great to hear about this as an option. Um, to, surprisingly, there's a number of council members who do not know that we have diversion programs that the city offers. So it's really good to put a spotlight on one that has been very uh, effective. Um, my only question that I have was regards to the eligibility piece in terms of if the city attorney's office or uh, along with Urban Ventures are re-evaluating or revisiting the criteria to see if there's opportunities for expansion and potential to reach you know, potential applicants too. So uh, thank you, Chair Chavez, Council Member Wansley. We are in communication almost daily, and if there is ever a qualify, if someone comes and we have a question as screening attorneys, we give Urban Ventures the ultimate say. Um, I will. That's our answer for how we let Urban Ventures pick, and I'll let you answer. And and the. And the real question um, um, to that is that our programming right now is uh, has been developed um, to obviously address the three issues that I gave in the beginning. Um, it, it, we don't, our curriculum is not developed to deal with uh, certain types of behaviors. Uh, so right now, we are kind of limited in the behaviors, uh, the type of behaviors that um, can, can be addressed uh, successfully. So, you know, um, not unless we are going to expand and, and develop a different curriculum. And, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Vice Chair Wansley. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Uh, just a brief thank you, a heartfelt thank you to you, Ms. Priscilla and Maurice. This is really good work. Uh, I appreciate the attorney's office coming in today. Heidi, thank you. And, and I can tell that you're doing this from your heart. And I'll never forget your, your point that changing families changes the community. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Vainville. Um, I just have one question. I think one of the best advice I, I received is that in order to reduce gun violence, one way towards that is providing someone a job, a paid union job with $50,000. And it is something that has always stood with me. So I appreciate the conversation about resume building, that workforce development part. Mm -hmm. One quick question I have is, is there a relationship with the building trade or any unions that your program has with? Um, if not, it's just a question because I think there's an, an opportunity there to help even increase the impact of the program? We are, we are looking into, yeah. uh, we have a, a new program that is under the umbrella of Urban Ventures that's doing some um, uh, collaboration with trades and in uh, construction. One of our other programs we're looking at collaborating with that, so that's something that is on the table that Perfect. we're looking at. Sweet, and if there's anything mm -hmm. this body can help support our city attorney's office as well. It is just an important part of reducing gun violence and it's helping change somebody's life. So I thank you all so much for being here today, the city attorney's office, you both for helping with this presentation and showing how investments into our community can help reduce gun violence and save people's lives. So we appreciate it. We can follow up with some other conversations about how we can better support you all. So thank you for thank inviting you. us.
Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the next item we have is a receiving and filing a presentation on the Next Step Program and the Youth Group Violence Intervention Program. Here to present on this item is Director Luana Nelson-Brown from the Neighborhood Safety Department. I also thought I saw Jalila here. I'm not sure if she's going to be presenting as well. Uh, and then what I'll say is we do have to get out of here by 3.45 p.m. Yeah. We'll have time for the presentation. We may have to move discussion to the next meeting depending on how the, how the conversation goes. How do I? The other aspect that we have after uh, consulting with the vice chair is we might just have, if, you, if members of this body have questions, we can just present them aloud. We'll, say, we'll mention it to our clerks team, and the clerks can then follow up with the neighborhood safety department so we can get those answers to those questions. No, I didn't bring a flash drive. <laughs> One quick second. Can you pull it up? Okay, thank you. <laughs> waiting on a waiting on a quick flash drive cool. very quickly. And we have um, Jalila with us too. Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay. And as we get that started, I was just uh, noting for our clerks. I know they're working hard on this uh, hard drive thing. Uh, we will not have maybe time for the whole. We'll have time for the presentation. Right. If members have questions, what we're going to do is then ask those questions publicly, we'll have the clerks note those questions down, and then we'll just have the department follow up uh, with answers to those questions just because of the time crunch. Excellent. Uh, if the public is just tuning in right now, there was a hiccup with our technology earlier this afternoon, which set us behind tremendously, which is why we're here a little bit late. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Chavez and Vice Chair Wansley and committee members. Um, as the flash drive is on its way over, I can still um, kind of jump in. Um, thank you for inviting us um, to talk a little bit about some of our initiatives aimed at reducing gun violence. I'm really excited um, to tell you about what's going on and what we're looking at moving forward. Um, thank you. I appreciate you. Um, as you know, I've got um, some of our outreach folks here with us today. Um, I'm going to give just a really brief over, oops, overview of um, the department itself and what it looks like because I feel like there's a need for a little bit of rebranding for us. Um, as we moved from OVP, Office of Violence Prevention, into neighborhood safety, I think it's important for us to, to note that we are very committed and very invested in the entire ecosystem. Um, that ecosystem actually lives in our department. So we are not just prevention, as we've been known previously. We provide services that span the entire ecosystem, prevention, response, and restoration and healing. Um, we're not law enforcement, um, which is the traditional response to public safety. Law enforcement, us, um, all of community safety needs to work together in order for us to see improvements. Um, I had a conversation in my first week of employment here um, with former uh, director Sasha Cotton. One of the things she said to me that I'll never forget is that as we move into this ecosystem approach, it's not um, an either or approach. It's not either law enforcement or alternatives. It is not a both and approach. It is an all in approach. And that is the direction and where we are starting moving forward as we uh, work with services. So as we're looking at prevention through restoration, um, it's important for us to remember that taking this holistic approach um, gives us a chance to focus on the gaps in services, focus on what we're missing, focus on what we're doing well, and then move from there to um, investing in those services that, that give us the best return. Um, so today we're, we're going to just touch on briefly, because in the essence of time, um, one of the prevention services, which is GVI, which you heard mentioned a little bit earlier, group violence intervention. Um, we also have responder programs like BCR, Behavior Crisis Response. We're not going to touch on that today. Um, and our restorative practices um, or healing services like the Next Step hospital-based programs. Um, all of these things allow us to not only address violence, but address the culture 
of violence that exists that allows violence to happen. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, GVI. Uh, was very popular conversation a little bit earlier. <laughs> um, our group violence intervention program is one that I'm most exci excited about. Um, one of the reasons I actually took this job is because of my experience with GVI in another state, and I've seen it work. I've seen it work as long as um, the collaborative approach is maintained, as long as everyone is invested. Um, this across cities, across countries, across the country in multiple city, this approach actually reduces gun violence. And one of the reasons it does is because it uses a focused deterrence approach. Um, it's also excellent in changing the culture of violence. It reduces homicide, gun violence, um, and minimizes harm to community by replacing enfor enforcement with deterrence. It also strengthens relationships. And when I came on board um, here in Minneapolis, what I saw um, is that the relationship piece was the piece that was broken. And that makes perfect sense, right? Because um, 2020 broke all of us <laughs> in some way, shape, or form, but no place probably more than here. Um, and when the relationships broke, the initiative um, took, took a pause, took a pause. We're no longer in that place, however. We are moving forward with GVI. Um, and for the sake of the public, I want to give a really brief overview of what that model that you heard earlier looks like. It's highly collaborative, um, and it only works when all of the players play, um, the players being law enforcement, probation and parole and MPD comprise law enforcement, community members with strong moral voices, and social service social services um, providers. So, so, social service providers. I don't know why I'm tongue-tied today, apologies. <laughs> All come together on the same page with the same message, delivering that message to the people who are group involved that commit the majority of... Um, gun violence. And that's something that I think the general public doesn't know. Those of us who do this work every day, we know this and some, we often forget that the public doesn't know this particular statistic, which um, is highlighted in the GVI initiative, is that typically 70% of shootings are committed by 0.5% of the population. So when we're talking about a focused deterrence approach, the GVI initiative focuses on that 0.5% or whatever the percentage is for our city. And that is one of the metrics that actually we'll be tracking um, as we move forward. Uh, a quote that I love to, to use that, that explains focused deterrence a little bit is that it's research validated method for reducing violence committed by a small number of chronic offenders. And when it's done correctly, it reduces law enforcement's footprint and empowers communities to produce their own public safety. That's really important in understanding why this approach works. And it has worked not only in other places, but also here. You heard a, a little bit earlier um, that uh, we reduce gun violence here. This is what that looked like. In 2016, there was 93 non-fatal shootings involving group members, um, and GVI was launched in 2017 here, and then from 2017 to 2019, there were only 27 non-fatal shootings involving group members. During that time, over 430 people were served, um, and um, things were looking fantastic. That I will point out, is 2017 to 2019, which is prior to 2020. Now we're post-2020, um, and we are still using the exact same approach. The biggest hurdle for me walking in the door was fixing the broken relationships. And that is what I've spent the last six months doing. Now we have a commitment from all of our key players and all of our key partners to move this forward. And I'm happy to say we have hired a program manager <laughs> who starts on March 25th. Um, so early April, 
GVI um, is going to move forward in full force, not only GVI, but also YGVI, which is the youth-focused version of GVI, are all moving forward, all with commitment from all of our players. Um, in a few weeks, you'll see before you the contract that we're renewing with the National Network for Safe Communities. Um, they are helping us to shape our messaging and to shape our key metrics. Um, and helping us build those relationships as well. So with that said, I am going to actually let you hear from um, our outreach partners that actually do the work, um, because I think it's most powerful hearing from the ground. All of the solutions that we're looking for are found in community, and so this is a good time for us to take the time to hear from community. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to actually call up um, Wes Berry, who is the CEO of W. Berry Consultant, Consulting and one of the community members that we part, partner with to do outreach services. Welcome. Oh, thank you. How are you doing today? We're great. So G, as she stated, GPI is definitely a success and has been a success in the past. We have, as she said, well over 400 participants that we have served, 85 to 95 percent of those participants have gotten out of the lifestyle and have no longer been engaged in gun violence. They have become educated in the sense of they've gone to school where they got GEDs, went to get college degrees, opened businesses like LSCs, open car lots, become CNAs, uh, RNs, even uh, to the extent where they themselves has now become mentors and positive influencers within their own families. And it's a very circular approach, and it's important, as the director stated, that we are all in on this and with this. It's extremely important that we work with the community, moral groups, as well as law enforcement in order to reduce the gun violence. The key piece is having the outreach there to intervene when those things arise. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I can't even put it into words how important that really is to have outreach there to speak with those of victims of gun violence and perpetrators of gun violence, to get them to reduce the gun violence and lay down those guns and pick up a different lifestyle and guide them and walk them through the, transit, the lifestyle transition. It can be difficult to walk away from a lifestyle that you were either born into, consist, excuse me, consistently influenced into living, and when we show up, it's hard to lay those things down. It's hard to let those things go by. That's where we and the community collaborative come in at is to get them to do that and be able to paint that picture and walk with them as they continue to make that lifestyle change and transition. We have participants that have relocated and have taken what they have learned from us and what we have taught them and started to do those things in other cities. Within their own community and within their own household, they themselves have become the voice in doing these things in order to reduce, or should I say, uh, not just reduce, but prevent anybody from picking up a gun or thinking about picking up a gun in order to commit a violent crime. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are any questions for what, no, you said we're, we're short on time. So <laughs> thank you, Wes. Thank you. Um, directly from the community. Um, I'd like to also call up Jalila Abdul-Brown, who's the Executive Director of Change Starts with Community, and is one of our partners, is she, is she here? Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and is one of our partners that works specifically with youth and YGVI. Thank you. I can, I Welcome, Jalila. Hey, um, we had a slide, is it right there? So. We can put the slides back up, thank you. It was a flash drive here. Yeah, the slides are here, um, I think, right? We have the slides up here. It says change starts with community, and then it starts. Yeah, we had a white separate. drive up here. That a, flash drive. a flash drive. Huh. Was here. Yeah. Was here. I'm not seeing it now. Can you move down it? Okay. Can you move it down? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm not sure what happened um, to the flash drive, but. Let me just give you an overview of the pilot that we started, which is the Youth Group Violence Intervention, YGVI as we call it. 
um, the introduction, it was started um, as a, and it provides support and resources to steer young individuals and families away from group involved violence based on the evidence based GVI model. It aims to reduce group involved homicide and gun violence. The city of Minneapolis neighborhood safety department initiated YGVI in 2021. The collaboration with Hennepin County juvenile probation began the first YGVI referral pathway in 2022. We actually did not receive any youth though until the year of 2023. And that's when our contracts also got in place. Um, it's collaborative efforts. The initiative involves community organizations working with at-risk youth, and the goal is to keep youth safe, alive, and free. The partners include neighborhood safety departments, Hennepin County, and community-based organizations. The approach is YGVI offers tailored services for young people addressing their unique needs and support systems 2023, we had 36 youth enrolled in YGVI across four organizations, with Change Stars with Community and Change Equals Opportunity enrolling the most youth. And that's due to us having, um, for this particular initiative, the most staff. We had a 2% recidivism rate and a 0% death rate, which is huge amongst youth. The services are delivered by community organiza organizations with customs meetings deciding which organization has the capacity and the fit for the youth, we then use credible messengers with lived experience in group and click violence as outreach support professionals and mentors and life skill builders. The services are voluntary and do not impact other available services or legal proceedings. The initiative aims to intervene early by creating pathways from law enforcement referrals. A component of our programming is an at-risk youth job stipend and agriculture exposure and the career educational exposure opportunities, which takes YGVI youth to various sites. Change Stars with Community has a partnership with the Cargill Foundation for this component of the program, and Change Equals Opportunity uses city funds for the stipend component of the program. Change Stars with Community also offers a weekly youth mental health check-in on site at Shiloh Temple with licensed mental health professionals and certified peer recovery specialists because we saw a lot of youth were also um, using drugs. Now the YGVI expansion project, this is what Mary Moriarty and everybody was just talking about. What does that look like? The project partners are working with the GVI YGVI technical assistance partner, the National Network for Safe Communities, to ensure a referral process that is objective and data informed in alignment with the GVI principles. This process is not rigid, but linear and voluntary. The referral process as currently planned at a minimum, referrals must meet two or more of the following indication of group involvement with gun violence as a victim or perpetrator or a family member of someone involved with group involved gun violence as a victim or perpetrator. For example, we got a youth referred from, we work with Hennepin County Probation. We got one youth referred that was 13 that stole 50 cars. I was in shock. He was only 13 years old, okay? So what did we do to him? We didn't look at him like, no, he can't be, he's a lost case. No, the Cargill literally CEO came on site and he heard all of these stories from this youth, these youth, and he said, let's give them a job. He said, let's give them a pathway forward, not just, um, giving them handouts, but let's give them a hand up and give them some jobs. And he paid for it out of his pocket. Also who came on board with this was Senator Bobby Joe Champion. He is a North Sider, and as you know, North Minneapolis and the Phillips neighborhood has some of the highest crime in this city, okay? So we had those youth from all over the city, and they began to put their money and their thoughts forward to say, how can we get these youth um, a boot up? But not just the youth, but their families. So we also offer a monthly program that is called Trauma Response in partnership with the Next Step program, where when victims of violence are shot, we also deal with the parents and the families to get them up to speed so that we can also prevent further trauma to the families. So what that looks like is the referral process, if we continue to expand this, would look like we could take custom notification meetings, which we already do, with referrals from juvenile DOCCR and expansions would include 
uh, the county attorney's office, but also law enforcement, MPD, schools, and parks. And currently, our organization, as well as Change Equals Opportunity, does receive um, referrals from law enforcement. So a lot of our youth that we did receive did come from MPD, which is good because MPD sees them first. So they'll call me like, hey, Jalil, I think we got some kids going down the pipeline. Can you take them? Um, another thing we do is custom notification with the youth and the family. This is not law enforcement led with youth, but it's law enforcement referred. And why is that? Because when you try to sit down with youth and their families with law enforcement, we uh, noticed that they didn't show up. Right. But when we took those referrals from MPD, we reached out to the families. The youth actually showed up. So we want results. Um, and then the provider support and outreach, custom notification review meetings and custom notification youth check in meetings no less than once per week, and then monthly youth YGVI reports are sent to NSD and the Hennepin County Juvenile's Office. So in conclusion, future pathways may include youth who are not just as involved. We actually take youth who are not just as involved because, once again, Cargill has put their money behind this, so we're able to take youth who are not just as involved. Um, but they are high risk of getting caught up in the cycles of violence. More law enforcement referrals, such as MPD, Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, schools, parks, and community referrals. To expand this pilot program, it would require an increase in consistent funding for community organizations working with the YGVI program for additional personnel to capture data, outputs, and outcomes using data systems or tracking, which Change Charge with Community developed our own community violence intervention system. Funding would also expand infrastructure for further resources and referrals and to continue career and educational experiences. Prevention is a crucial step in the Minneapolis Safe and Thriving, Thriving Communities Report. And with the YGVR, we now have an opportunity with YGVI to build a continuum of entry points for youth center prevention and intervention. Thank you. Thank you. I see the time is 3.45, or 3.46. <clears throat> so, Chair Chavez. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just I spoke with uh, BET president. They are fine with just a five-minute late start, so we can go right up until 4. Okay. So it, you can proceed with the presentation, and per Perfect. usual, or per as Chair Chavez mentioned, we'll say questions at the end for you all to then complete the memo process in collaboration with the clerks. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so you just heard um, from directly from the ground what it's going to look like moving forward, both with GVI and YGVI. Um, I lose, lost my uh, lost my thing, um, which brings us right quickly into the restorative services, which is um, healing. Um, I've been working with uh, violence uh, intervention and prevention for 30 years. Half of those years were spent working directly with victims of crime. Um, and I can tell you that the healing portion is vitally important, which is why I'm happy that it's part of our uh, ecosystem. Um, and next step, hospital-based services are a part of the restorative services. The reason it's important is because the faster you can bring people whole, the faster you can get to solutions. And with that, I would like to, you to hear from um, Contral Galloway, who is the executive director of the Next Step program. Thank you for having me. Uh, the slide's up. Yep. Uh, um, I don't know if many of you know about the Next Step program, but we're the state's only hospital-based violence intervention and prevention program. We're more on the intervention right now, but we're hoping to get in more into the prevention. But this is just some of our numbers that we did for 2023. Um, we had 599 new participants that we signed up for the program. And as you can see, <coughs> um, States that don't have hospital-based violence intervention programs usually have a recidivism rate of around 36 or 37 percent. Um, those that have them is around 3 percent. We are at that 3 percent. So our recidivism rate for folks returning back to our hospitals that we serve in, which is HCMC, North Memorial, Abbott Northwestern, and Children's Minnesota, everybody who signs up for, with us because we are a voluntary program, we have a 3 percent of recidivism rate of folks coming back into the hospital. Before you go on to the next slide, can you just take off the, it says, oh, just so the public can see the data. Thank yeah. you. you can, yep. Yep. Can I? 
also just ask for a clarification too. Um, is this severed 832 or served 832? So we served 832 people all together in 2023. Of that 832, 599 were new participants. They were new to the program. Okay, so I just want to note that there's a typo there. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. We didn't see. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so our, basically our program is to, is to heal, to heal people, help heal socially, emotionally, and mentally. And that starts about first when they're coming up into our health system, because we all know the health system, health system itself is very, is very challenged. So when people come in there, we already have our hospital staff putting implicit bias, or sometimes we have racist practice that within our hospital system that our group is there to challenge and to make sure people are getting equitable treatment as they're coming up. And their families too, because sometimes the hospital is putting a barrier so they don't want family to come up and they're already putting up some kind of um, they're, they're, they're saying that the family when they come up we're bringing violence to the hospital where well, we're there to say no we want the family to come to the hospital because we want them to have a place to grieve we don't we want them to understand what's happening to their loved one in the hospital but more importantly we want them not to go back out in the community and do something irrational the retaliation piece to stop that cycle of violence to say that is another way and as we work with participants in the hospital, um, as they get admitted to the hospital, our, our um, retention rate, when we talk to people who get admitted to the hospital, we have a 97% chance of having people sign up if they get admitted into the hospital. That rate does drop when people are just triaged and they go through the emergency room and they're, and they're discharged. We're around 50%, but we're trying to improve that rate. But that, again, goes we have to have more staffing to do that. But we're working on it. Um, there we go. And then also, as we talk about, we've heard a lot about trauma-informed practices. We are also a trauma-informed practice. We, we are implementing ARC not only for our team, but also for the hospital that we're serving at ACMC. We're trying to make all of our, um, our providers and the health teams who are serving our patients be more trauma-informed to help them understand that they are the tool who can help de-escalate some of these situations and figure out what they're bringing to the table so to make sure that they are themselves healed before they can go out and start having conversations with people and making sure they're not re-traumatizing people as they're showing up to a place of healing. So that's one of our initiatives that we're working on. And then we also have, we also have, have our own community collaborative group with uh, Empower Therapeutics and Wellspring Second Chance, where we call it the Harriet Initiative. It's a trauma recovery group that meets every Tuesdays at 5.30, where folks can come and get some tools about work, um, anger management and then also some uh, mental health services, where they're trying to build a toolkit as they're starting to re-engage back in their community and build their shield back up. Um, that usually is a 12-week program where people come we serve them dinner, then they have their program. We also provide daycare, because sometimes that's a barrier, and we also provide transportation, because we don't want there to be any barriers about why people can't come to the program. And then also that dinner, just to just, just sit around and have a conversation with people about what's going on in their life. And I know our program also provides financial assistance or um, mental health, we find mental health providers or help find job opportunities, but the greatest thing that we have, as most people have talked about, is the relationship that we build with people. Because we don't have a discharge program because what happened to folks has changed their lives forever. So they can use us as long as they need us. So we're on that walk with them. Um, I always say this and I'll keep saying it, um, being shot is not normal. And people keep asking, well, what can we do? Well, we need a not normal response. And I feel like what we do is a not normal response so we can start helping people heal. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And that is why I wanted you to hear directly from the ground. Um, and that is the conclusion of our yeah. presentation right smack on time. Um, thank if you. you'd like to shoot any questions, we can. Otherwise, we can do that through memo. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Director Nelson Brown. What I'll have is if my colleagues could put themselves on cue uh, just to ask questions, and you won't have to answer them right now. We'll just have the clerks note those questions down. Perfect. We'll receive that memo, and that will suffice for today. Thank uh, you. As I mentioned earlier, the hiccup this morning with the technology made it so we fell extremely behind. So That's I'll okay. go with thank Vice Chair Wansi first. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Chair Chavez, and thank you uh, to uh, NSD for bringing our community partners in to talk about both GBI and why GBI. 
um, a couple of questions that I have, and I'll also email these over <laughs> to the court. I know you all <laughs> like those, uh, like that process. Um, so the first being on slide seven um, is share. Well, the GVI metrics are only listed from 2017 through 2019. I'm interested in knowing what the metrics from 2020 to 2024 were. Um, next question is, I would like clarification on slide 12. Um, basically, uh, with the numbers that were provided, um, it, it basically leads to an estimate of about 500 people agreed to use the community-based services and wanting to know of that 500, how many actually utilize the services. Um, and then the next bullet point talks about 75% uh, of those who use community-based services achieve progress on their identified goals. Um, so I also wanted to note or know uh, the actual number of individuals who use the service and were identified as achieving their goals and giving or receiving some examples of what those goals look like. Um, and then uh, Director Nelson Brown also uh, touched on this briefly, but I did see um, our contract with, I believe, even John Jay College, uh, the communities or connecting communities for change, no, National Network for Safe Communities, um, basically that contract had lapsed. So it's interesting to hear that we're, we're actually working with them um, or that there will be a renewal. So I did want to inquire about the status of that contract and then follow up on that. Um, Director Nelson Brown mentioned that, yes, the public is often not aware of the model around uh, GVI. I will actually extend that to probably council members who uh, a majority of us just joined council just last uh, year and then also have some new folks coming in this term. It would be good um, if John Jay, once that contract is solidified, if they can come and work with both council member Chavez and I to do a presentation on the model itself uh, for PHS. Um, so I wanted that follow up too. So again, I'll send those questions your way to over email, but those are the questions I had. Thank you, Council Vice Chair Wansi. If you, yeah, I was just gonna say if you can work with the clerks to make sure that we have exactly what we're looking for. Um, looking at the queue, I don't have any follow up questions. Uh, nobody else is on queue. Thank you again for that presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I will direct the clerk to receive and file that report. Seeing no further business before us, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>